Okay, so we are on our second class train to uh, Rajasthan and we're actually at the Delhi station right now and it's been quite some time for us to be on the Indian train but this is one of the main transports to get around uh, all of India so right now it's looking uh, early morning here and, uh, and we'll be in Rajasthan probably in the next like eight or nine hours. Welcome back to India. For us it had been a while but it didn't seem like a lot had changed. Our journeys this time around would bring us to the Kumbh Mela Festival, which was expected to be the largest religious gathering in human history. It was estimated that over 120 million Hindu worshippers would descend upon the city of Allahabad over the course of the next two months. A major festival like this only happens once every 12 years. But one of the things we wanted to profile before we headed to the Kumbh were the practices of Hinduism so the plan was to travel to three pilgrimage locations throughout the subcontinent. Allahabad, Varanasi, and our first location in the eastern state of Rajasthan, the Karnimata Temple. So we just made it into Rajasthan and really on this journey to India we wanted to document and show the practices of Hinduism. You know, not a lot of people know that there's estimates that there's 250 million different gods that have been worshipped in Hinduism. And many times among these gods you'll see animals being worshipped and that's the reason why cows roam around so freely or they might be in the middle of the roads. But tomorrow we're going to a temple that is very unique because it actually has a practice where rats are worshipped there. And it's even nicknamed the Rat Temple. So we're going to head out there first thing in the morning and this should be quite an experience. even inside the temple and then out in like the courtyard area. It's actually quite big. This whole like temple complex is really, really big. And uh, right now we're kind of inside the, the main temple. What you can kind of see behind me is like this big like platter of milk basically. And uh, this is all just like offerings that people bring for the rats and they bring like little bags of milk and they kind of pour them in as, as offerings. But it kind of smells like really like curdle almost, you know? And then you'll just see dozens of rats at a time basically just drinking out of it. Pretty wild though. It's like you see a lot of people walking barefoot. You know, we got these little like slippers, literally like rat droppings all over them, kind of walking on. And these just nasty little sewer rats that you kind of come across. And this one was trying to shimmy up my leg. I, you know, I think about my mother coming here and she's absolutely petrified of mice. So you throw her in this uh, rat temple and she'd be catatonic for, I don't know, years. So it's, it's pretty hardcore. It's not that screamish. If you, uh, if you got a little bit of a rat phobia, then this is not the place to be. What is it? Full white rat in there. The white rat, it's, it is lucky and uh, if you see it in the temple, it's like you are very lucky. So what about if like one like runs across your feet, is that, is that good luck too? Or? Yeah, that's also good luck. Okay, good luck. Did you ever have a nipple on you? Little, little no. bites? No? No. So if you stamp on it, you will have to donate a silver or gold rat to the temple. Really? You can't stamp on it. Yeah. No. 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 So you can see all the people that kind of pour into this temple. They come from everywhere too, throughout India. This is actually a really big like uh, pilgrimage point. Like Indians and Hindus will come and uh, visit. Yeah, it's quite a spectacle to see, just like how people kind of like get to the point of you know of, of revering, of, of you know touching, wanting to touch, wanting to see like the rat that they they come across. I mean, because everybody always looks at rats as you know disgusting and dirty and carrying filth and germs and you know the plague and everything that's come about but you know people here are just like they're like drawn to them when we saw a mother like putting her like infant baby sitting it just above the rats and they wanted them to come around and interact with the rats and everything like that in 
In the Karnimata temple, there are over 25,000 rats, and the belief among Hindus who visit is that the rats are reincarnated humans of a particular clan, and to pay respect to them will bring good fortune, health, and prosperity. The cycle of life and death, good and bad works, and the worshipping of certain animals are the foundations of Hinduism. And no matter how contrary these practices are to the common knowledge of germs and disease, they are still faithfully followed. The next stop on our journey as we profiled Hinduism would take us to the revered city of Varanasi, where tens of millions of pilgrims come each year to bathe in the Ganges or to cremate a deceased family member. The belief among Hindus is that if a person's ashes are poured into the Ganges, it can break the cycle of reincarnation and give rest to the soul. Morning time in the Ganges. Pretty wild coming back out here again. It's like, you know, we're walking through the alleyways and it's like dark and all of a sudden you get out here and it's just like boats everywhere, pyres are going, people are singing. It's, uh, it's Varnassi. see the burning gas back there and no matter how many times you, you see it it's always just uh, quite a spectacle I mean it's like literally like three four bodies being burned right now you see them kind of parade the bodies down uh, wash them in the Ganges and then they place them on the pyres the funeral pyres and this goes on all day every day throughout the year never never ending it's just constantly going about to come on the main bathing gat here. Yeah. This is where everybody, all the pilgrims come to bathe. I mean, there's at least like a couple hundred thousand. It's just the one this gat itself. Beyond the cremations, Hindus also consider bathing in the Ganges as a temporary way to cleanse sins. But the danger of such an act is real, as the Ganges is listed as one of the most contaminated rivers in the world. Since the foundation of Varanasi, partially cremated corpses, animal carcasses, human waste, and raw sewage have been dumped into the waters. And as a result, when pilgrims enter the bathing ghats, they risk contracting dysentery, cholera, or hepatitis. Oh man, look at this. There's just so many people down here at the ghats. I mean, just behind us, there was a there was a corpse that was just going by. I know, and they're washing clothes too. So we're gonna go out there and there's gonna be millions of people out there. They basically had to create a whole other city. So what we're doing, we're just getting to the traffic to get outside of the town right now. And you know, India's hectic. It's hectic without like events going on, you know? And the Kuma Mela going on is like exacerbated, uh, you know, a hundred times more. So we're making our way to the streets and then uh, hopefully we'll be in a lullaby in probably about three hours or so.
give an update? Yeah, we have covered a lot of ground so far. First, we were at the Rat Temple, then Varnassi, and now here we are in Alalabad for the Kumbh Mela Festival. And look at this. You can see the mass amount of tents and camps and makeshift housing. And this morning we heard an estimate that there's about 30 million people here right now. And over the course of the next two months, they're expecting to have about 120 million people here. Man, I mean, you can't even see across. I know. All tents and stuff. Tricky kind of getting around this place. It's all sorts of like bridges you have to cross. I mean, it's like this whole layout of a ground is just massive. And tomorrow is the main bathing date. And this is where everybody comes to. And there's like tens of millions of people that are gonna be down there basically. And uh, we're gonna be right in the mix of it. So it's a huge uh, kind of ordeal that goes on. It's just like as far as you can see these people. And this is like at it's about 4.30. And uh, the bathing starts at sunrise. But I mean, this is a slow move across. Yeah, so everyone is trying to get into position for bathing. And all these pilgrims have come from all over India. And some of them have traveled for days to get here and even slept outside. But what we're about to witness is probably considered to be one of the most holy events in Hinduism. Right now we're waiting for the sadhus to come out. And they come down here and they walk down for about a kilometer. And then they are the first ones to go in and bathe in the Ganges before anybody else in the public can go in. They uh, purify the water according to, to the beliefs. So everybody else goes in immediately afterwards. dawn they wash, and every light in the distance represents tens of thousands of people. They are searching for their sins to be forgiven, to find absolution. For them the path of salvation is based upon their own good and bad works. They believe no one can bear it for them, and they must find their own way to eternity. Millions will come to this place, hoping that in the next life, they will have a better life. They are searchers and wanderers with no assurance of what the future will bring. Look at this, behind me, all of these people, and look at this whole hillside. And you know, it just shows you people are searching for salvation and the forgiveness of sins. And we've seen it at the Rat Temple, Varnassi, and now this massive event of the Kumbh Mela. And really for us, we've been coming you know, to India for over 15 years now. And the one thing that we know is that people are open to the gospel. They're open to hear the message of Christ Jesus because they are searching. And really the call to the church when you see and witness things like this is that the harvest is plentiful, 
but the labors are few. You know, and that's why we keep coming back again and again, because we know that God sent His Son to die for the sins of the world, and there's power in that message. Because in that, we know that we don't have to go it alone. We need only to believe in Him. Galapagos Islands lay 563 miles off the coast of Ecuador. It's home to some of the most unique marine and wildlife on the planet. More notedly, it's known as the place where Darwin first formulated his theory of evolution. But what most people don't know about the Galapagos is that today there is a thriving population of believers on nearly every island in the group. With such a strong presence of the church, integrating and experiencing life with the locals here would be even more special. After a few days of our arrival, between church services and outreach, we came across a fishing shop on the island of Isabella. It was small and indescript, but we could tell right away the owner would be a kindred spirit. We are coming along the street here and you see uh, Peter here had his scripture right on the front of his storefront and he does fishing and we, we saw that and we were like, oh, you know, we've got to be able to talk to him and, you know, we love fishing. What's really encouraging about all of the Galapagos Islands is really just the movement of the Lord in this, these places we saw on Santa Cruz Island and now we're seeing on uh, Isabella, you know, just strong believers. But I love how he has, you know, the Word of God just right on his uh, storefront. So we're going to really try to hook up with him and do some fishing and uh, go out because you know we love fishing. But uh, one of the things they catch here is wahoo. And uh, wahoo is the, uh, the one that maimed me in uh, South Pacific. So we're excited to see what the Lord's going to do here and uh, get out there and do some fishing. <laughs> Next morning, Peter and his son met us at the dock, and he told us he liked people who were both fishers of men and fishers of the sea. We prayed together for a good day, and then set out on the waters to experience life in the Galapagos. Pulling right out to this volcanic island right out here. We had a storm come through last night. Looks like we still got some remnants. There's some giant rolling waves out here. All right, so we're going along the, uh, the waters here. Quite amazing coming out here. You get out in this open waters, so it's like teeming with fish. Uh, like today, we're, we're fishing for tuna and uh, walu. So uh, don't really know what to expect as far as fishing out here. So we're hoping for the best. There's like this rock just up here we're kind of heading towards. And uh, we got like the GPS, they're kind of looking at some coordinates and stuff like that. So. We're gonna drop our lines in and uh, see what happens. Really? Oh! Wow! It's a wahoo, dude. Oh! What is that? I think he's got your wow. fish. The sea lion's actually got the fish. He's yeah. The fish. He's stealing the fish. What was it? Sea lion? It's a sea it's lion. A lion. Oh, yeah. oh, he's like, like mauling it. <laughs> and do you see all that blood come up? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, that oh, oh, oh. Look at that. Oh, I'm glad he ate. Look at the move. <laughs> wow. wow. What's left? That would have been nice. <laughs> Is that a good size? Yeah. That's nice. Does that happen a lot? Yeah. A lot, huh? We need to be more fast. 
I am. More fast. You gotta get it in. <laughs> that was a big sea lion too, wasn't it? A beakus. He had him in his mouth. And there's just like all this like blood that went to the surface. I mean, it was just real carnage. I mean, that's what you get out here on the island. That's how wild it is. I've never seen fishing like that where the, you're, you're competing with the sea lions. There's something back there though. I did see something. Man, once those strike, it's just boom. Here we go. Oh yeah. Got one? Yeah. Look at this. Yeah, he's fighting like a dog. Oh, easy. He's way out there. Oh, yeah. I can see him. Got a fighter here. Oh, yeah. Coming under the boat. Give him that line, Bill. Give him the line. Yeah. Nice little tuna we brought in there. Wow. Look at that. Nice. There you go. Get a little more leverage. There you got him. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Here we go. Nice. Don't, don't get a lot of ice still left in. This male of tea. That was great to bring in. It was like a nice, like, bite. 50 libras. Nice. Look at all the blood on there. Blood on the towel. There we go. Just like Got that. It. Another one. Bite's hard, doesn't he? Get him. Wear him out. Get him in before the sea lies. What is this? Wahoo? Yeah, baby. The, the tuna dive right near the boat. Oh, wow. That's a good day. Man, they, the, the bite is on today. You just literally throw your line in, boom. Right at the boat, you just like kick off again. <laughs> yeah, there he come is. On, come on, right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get me away from this thing. <laughs> Okay, wahoo. Ah. You gotta watch when these things start splashing around. That's bigger than the one we caught in the Guinea. It is. That's the same type that ripped me apart in the South Pacific. I've always wanted to catch another wahoo. So we were trying to get in quick before the sea lions came. That one was fighting hard, man. See the bite marks on it? Those wahoo teeth are so sharp. Now that's fishing. That's fish. Praise God. I'm in. Wow. I'm in. All right. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Yes. Yes. My God. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're on our way back now, and it's been such a blessing today. You know, on a lot of our travels and missions, uh, we're in some tough areas or on some difficult journeys. So to experience a great day of fishing with fellow believers is really special for us. And these are some really, really good fish that we've caught. But, you know, what's even better is that we've got some great new friends. This is, uh, it can be always uh, a blessing. A real blessing, yeah. Yes, blessing. <laughs> That's good. He says that he are going to fish and he are going to remember you. That's yeah, good. We That's appreciate good. it. Yeah, thank That's you. That's very nice. Tell him we always like going out fishing in our travels because we love to fish, but we also love to go with believers, you know, that believe in the Lord, that you you know, believe in the same thing. So that's a real blessing for us to, to spend time with them. Yeah, it's very good. So we praise God for that. Gloria a Dios. Gloria a Dios. Yes. Gracias. 
All right, so right now we're at uh, the church called Hosanna Church here out on the islands of the Galapagos, and this is in the main island of Santa Cruz. But what's such a, an awesome uh, testimony is the fact that this church is thriving and well here, right on the Galapagos. And to see, you know, actually the thriving churches on all the different islands around here, you have, you know, the island of Isabella, there's a branch church uh, from this main Hosanna church, and then on the other islands as well too. So it's a, it's a real blessing. We're gonna go in tonight, but, um, but we felt really welcome, uh, and uh, we know that uh, God's got something special in store. On the journey of missions, you never know where life will take you. In one moment, you can be in a place so different and foreign. And in the next, in a place of indescribable beauty. Or in another, praising and worshiping the Lord with your brothers and sisters. For us, we know that wherever we go, God is with us, and that the truth in Him will always lead us and guide us. Around the world, the message upon our lips will tell of His great love and the salvation found in Christ Jesus. Life is too short to live for the cares of this world, so we'll boldly reach out for the purpose he's called us to. Because in him, there's life, and life more abundantly. Mm -hmm. 